Okay. So how about we go back to the agenda, Catherine? Okay, back to the agenda. Yeah. Um, so today for the so everyone that's watching the recording, Catherine and I have already introduced ourselves. I'm Kate Burroughs, and now we're gonna walk through the agenda for this presentation about borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. So we're gonna kick off with a deep introduction into borderline personality disorder, and we're gonna talk about emotion regulation and borderline. And then we're gonna switch over to bipolar disorder, which most of you are already pretty familiar with. And Catherine's gonna talk about emotion regulation and bipolar disorder. And we're gonna talk about the differences and similarities between these two diagnoses in terms of emotion regulation. Then we'll go talk about um, treatments for borderline personality disorder and treatments for bipolar disorder. Then I think one of the most interesting parts of this talk is we're going to talk about some of the genetics versus social factors in borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder and how those genetic and social factors may be similar or different. And then we'll talk about therapeutic modalities for treatments for both borderline and bipolar. So borderline personality disorder is a mental illness that impacts a person's ability to manage their emotions. So this loss of emotional control can increase, increase impulsivity, affect how a person feels about themselves, and can negatively impact your relationship with others. Um, there are effective treatments for borderline personality disorder that can help manage the symptoms. Um, Borderline personality disorder is estimated to occur in about 1.6 of the population. However, it is probably greatly underdiagnosed. And in primary care settings, it can reach up to 6%. And in outpatient mental health, it's up to 10%. And in inpatient mental health, is up to 20%. There is evidence that borderline personality disorder is more prevalent among younger age groups. And there's some theories that maybe people can grow out of it um, or that they change diagnoses as they get older um, because there is decreased prevalence in borderline personality disorder in older age groups. So the main four groups of symptoms for borderline personality disorder are interpersonal instability, affective dysregulation, behavioral dysregulation, and cognitive and self-disturbance. So with interpersonal instability, you look at fear of abandonment. And with fear of abandonment, that can be fear of perceived or actual abandonment. And people can go to great lengths to avoid this perceived or actual abandonment. Uh, the next part is disturbed and unstable relationships. So people with borderline personality disorder often are, you know, love-hate kind of people. I love you. I hate you. Don't leave me. In fact, that's the name of a book. Uh, I love you. I hate you. Don't leave me. Um, so that's a book, name of a book about borderline personality disorder. So you have a lot of instability in your relationships. With effective dysregulation, you see a lot of mood instability. So um, just like with bipolar disorder, you may have ups and downs. You may be um, very, very happy one moment and very, very depressed the next moment. Um, outbursts of anger, people with borderline personality disorder often have a hard time controlling their anger and um, may act out in anger, may behave violently or aggressively when they're angry. And also people with borderline personality disorder often feel great feelings of emptiness and loss and um, kind of like um, at a loss to, to describe who they are themselves. And that moves up to our cognitive self-disturbance in the upper right-hand corner. So with cognitive self-identity disturbance, you are going to see sometimes paranoia, ideation, dissociation, and identity disturbance. So with identity disturbance, what that means is that people with BPD often go through um, periods of time where they try on new identities. Like people with borderline personality may often, you know, one moment they are a great guitarist and the next moment they're into piano and the next moment they're into uh, speaking German and the next moment they're bisexual and then the next moment they are, um, you're going to be a race car driver. Like they're always trying on new identities. Um, and then in terms of behavioral dysregulation, you see a lot of suicidal and self-harming behavior. Self-harming, non-suicidal self-harm behavior occurs more commonly in borderline personality than with any other uh, mental illness. 
and then impulsivity. And the key here is that impulsivity with borderline personality disorder occurs outside of a manic episode. If you only see impulsivity within a, a period of increased activity, like we see with manic and hypomanic episodes and bipolar disorder, it may not be both borderline personality disorder. So I've already talked about a lot of this. Um, so you see that they experience intense mood swings and they feel uncertainty about how they see themselves. Their feelings for others can change quickly and swing from extreme closeness to extreme dislike. Uh, they also tend to view things in extremes. It's all good and all bad. So you hear a lot about black and white thinking. Borderline people, people with borderline personality disorder often have that black and white thinking. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, their interests and values can change quickly and they may act impulsively or recklessly. Also, I mentioned efforts to avoid real or perceived abandonment, a pattern of intense and unstable relationships with family, friends, and loved ones, and a distorted and unstable self-image or self uh, sense of self. Um, so I talked earlier about impulsive and often dangerous behaviors, such as spending sprees, unsafe sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, and binge eating. So get as careful, be careful when you think about these types of impulsive and reckless behaviors. When you think about borderline personality disorder versus bipolar disorder, these kinds of behaviors can happen in both. If they only occur in the context of a manic or hypomanic episode, it may be a sign of bipolar disorder or not borderline. And then again, like I said, people with borderline personality disorder often have, uh, I think up to 60 or 70% of people with borderline personality disorder engage in self-harming behavior, such as cutting or head banging or burning. So more signs and symptoms of borderline personality disorder, recurring thoughts of suicidal behaviors or threats, wow. intense and highly variable moods with episodes lasting from a few hours to a few days, chronic feelings of emptiness. I mentioned inappropriate, intense anger or problems controlling anger. I also mentioned feelings of dissociation or feelings of unreality. Uh, and it's important to know that just like if you see a list of uh, signs and symptoms of bipolar disorder, um, not everyone with borderline personality disorder will experience all of their all of these symptoms. Um, the symptoms vary from person to person. The disorder looks different from person to person. So don't take this list as like, oh, you have to have all seven of these things to have borderline personality disorder. It's just like bipolar and that everybody looks different. So I, talking about emotion regulation and borderline personal borderline personality disorder, um, a core feature of borderline personality disorder is emotional dysregulation in which people have reduced emotional awareness and clarity and reduced emotional granularity, which means they have difficulty in mood labeling and with understanding what emotion they're actually feeling at a particular time. Also, people with BPD have more problems employing emotional regulation strategies, which means that they have a harder time dealing with their emotions when these, um, when these emotions come up. Uh, people with BPD often employ maladaptive cognitive or coping strategies such as rumination and thought suppression. And people who engage in deliberate self-harm who have BPD often do so as a maladaptive coping mechanism in order to cope with their, um, with their difficult emotions and they use um, self-harm as a way to regulate their mood. So people with borderline personality disorder show more brain activation on neutral and not fearful facial expressions. So a lot of the, the a lot of the research on um, on emotion regulation looks at facial recognition, and they show people who are attached to um, to um, brain imaging devices, uh, they ENGs and stuff. What they're able to show is how people's brains light up when they're shown different kinds of faces, happy faces, neutral faces, fearful faces. And they find that with people with BPD, the amygdala hippocampal complex is more active during neutral and moderately fearful faces. And that this is linked to empathy and identity difficulties, which are associated with brain activation in the part of the brain called the precuneus. 
So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about self-harm and borderline. So self-harm or self-mutilation refers to the deliberate direct destruction of one's body tissue without conscious suicidal intent. Now, it is important to note that sometimes self-harm or self-injury can lead to accidental death, but it will consi be considered an accidental death and not suicide. It's very common in BPD, 50 to 80% of cases, and it is frequently repetitive in that more than 41% of patients make more than 50 self-harms or self-mutilations. Um, the most common form of self-mutilation is cutting, but you also see bruising, burning, head banging, or biting. And people with BPD who self-harm do so for a variety of reasons. Um, but some of the most common reasons is that it provides relief from negative mood states. It reduces distress. It obtains care from other people, such as therapists and their loved ones. And it expresses their emotions symbolically. Um, the rate of suicide in people with BPD is around 5 to 10%, which is more than 400 times out of the general population. So I'm talking a lot, Catherine, it's almost your turn. Um, so, so risk factors for borderline personality disorder, um, just like with bipolar, studies suggest that genetic, environmental, and social factors increase the likelihood of developing borderline. So these factors include family history, brain structure and function, and environmental, cultural, and social factors. So in terms of family history, if people have a close family member, such as a parent or a sibling with borderline, they're more likely to develop BPD themselves. In terms of brain structure and function, research shows that people with BPD have structural and functional changes in the brain, especially in the areas that control impulses and emotional regulation. Now, it's important to note that we're not sure if those changes in brain structure and function are leading, are causing the BPD, or actually a result of the BPD itself. That's not clear. So causal relationship is not clear. And then also many people with borderline personality disorder report having experienced traumatic life events such as abuse, abandonment, or hardship during childhood. And some people have experienced unstable or invalidating relationships or complex. So trauma and borderline personality disorder, they are closely linked. Um, people who experience trauma in childhood are more likely to develop BPD in adulthood or as teenagers. Um, insecure attachment has been described as the mediating the relationship between childhood trauma and dysfunctional personality traits in different mental disorders, including BPD and bipolar disorder. So during childhood, the relationship with the parent is a primary attachment, attachment. And if those bonds with your parent or, um, guardian have, um, Pathological features such as anxiety, anger, or depression, or detachment, that's going to impact your relationships in adolescence and adulthood. So BPD symptoms map closely to core features of extreme attachment and anxiety, such as affective ability, unstable relationships, feelings of emptiness, chronic abandonment, and identity uh, diffusion. So there is a lot of literature out there that describes the association between childhood traumatic experience and BPD. So people with BPD diagnosis report an incidence of both abuse and neglect with up 70 to up to 90% reporting some kind of maltreatment. So some, um, some research confirms that exposure to early adverse life events is associated with BPD. And um, that notes that emotional abuse and neglect are the subtypes of the largest effects, meaning that emotional abuse and neglect are most likely to have some relationship with BPD in adolescence and adult, adulthood. All right. Now it's Catherine's time to talk. Yeah. All right. What is bipolar disorder? Um, bipolar disorders are a complex group of severe and chronic disorders that include bipolar one disorder, defined by the presence of a syndrome, um, syndrome, syndromal manic episode, and bipolar two disorder, defined by the presence of a syndromal hypomanic episode and a major depressive episode. 
Um, cyclothymia is characterized by episodes of hypomanic and depressive symptoms that do not meet the full criteria from um, bipolar or major depressive um, disorder. Bipolar disorder substantially reduces psychosocial functioning. It has a high rate of heritability and shares genetic risks with many other mental and medical disorders. Bipolar 1 has a closer genetic association with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder relative to bipolar 2, which has a closer genetic association with major depressive disorder. Bipolar disorder also shares close genetic association with autism spectrum disorder. The high prevalence of childhood maltreatment in people with bipolar disorder and the association between childhood maltreatment and a more complex presentation of bipolar disorder um, for example, one including suicidality, highlight the role of adverse environmental exposures on the presentation of bipolar disorders. Emotion regulation in bipolar disorder. Individuals with bipolar disorder also display emotion dysregulation and compared to healthy controls have greater overall difficulty regulating emotions even during remission from mood disorders, for mood episodes. Um, evidencing elevated impulsivity in in emotionality in emotion emotionally arousing situations. I apologize, guys. I don't have my glasses. Poor suppression of emotion related neural hyperactivity, in, impaired um, reappraisal capacity, and a tendency to use negative attentional um, strategies such as rumination and catastrophizing to regulate mood. The medial prefrontal cortex, together with the amygdala, insula, anterior um, cingulate, and ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, are considered to be the most important nerve components for emotional processing and regulation. Keep in mind the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. That is one of the ma main um, parts of the brain that um, regulates emotions. Um, and just a quick fact here. Um, family focused therapy is the only, um, treatment modality that actually, um, helps, uh, grow parts of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which, um, regulates emotions. So it helps, um, it helps children and adolescents learn how to regulate their emotions, um, and, and grows part of their brain. Anyways. Um, so more on emo emotion regulation and bipolar disorder. Normally, when we are presented with a potentially emotive stimulus, our brains identify and evaluate relative internal and external cues that define the emotive, emotional significance of that stimulus. This results in an immediate overall affective state characterized by specific um, autonomic, hormonal, and somatic motor responses. The brain, however, also has a fairly complex set of feedback systems that ensure our brain behaviors and effective responses are appropriate in the context of everything else in the environment. Looking at a simplified neuroanatomical uh, model of emotional processing, limbic and subcortical regions such as the amygdala and insula function to appraise the emotional salience of a given stimulus and induce our initial effective outputs. Thus, neurons in the amygdala are activated when we are presented with an emotionally important stimulus, whereas con um, conscious attempts to suppress the resulting emotional response will decrease the neural activity, suggesting feedback regulation from the higher brain areas. This regulation of limbic activity or um, originates on cortical regions such as the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which perform cognitive reappraisal of the initial effective state and in integrating information from other brain areas to determine whether the intensity of the response is appropriate. Um, neurons in the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex therefore show increased activation both in response to the initial emotional stimulus and when an individual tries to reduce the evoked emotional output. Aberrations in these regions and their reciprocal connections may interfere with the ability of patients with bipolar disorder to maintain emotional homeostasis. Brain imaging of patients with bipolar disorder have supported this hypothesis by showing relative hyperactivation in subcortical and limbic su structures, including the amygdala, 
which is thought to reflect a state of ele elevated emotional reactivity. Conversely, hypoactivation in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex suggests an impaired ability to provide feedback regulation of emotional response. So family focused therapy, and this is what I was just talking about, but I had to throw it out there because I am super excited about this. This just came out a couple of years ago. Um, so family focused therapy um, for bipolar disorder. In a randomized controlled trial of fam uh, family intervention, early intervention for youth at risk for bipolar disorder, researchers found that symptomatic youth with first or second degree relatives with bipolar disorder had greater intrinsic connectivity between the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and anterior default mode network um, than did healthy comparison youth. Um, within the high risk group, youth receiving family focused therapy for high risk youth had increased connectivity from, connectivity from pre to post treatment in ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior default mode network connectivity, whereas the education control, the psychoeducation group, showed no significant change in connectivity over time. Further, when comparing post treatment network connectivity in high risk youth to um, healthy control network connectivity at baselines, there were stronger connectivities between ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and anterior default mode network and family focused therapy for high risk youth compared to healthy control youth or health um, high risk youth who received um, education control. Finally, enhanced um, anterior default um, mode network connectivity inversely co correlated with improvement in depression um, severity and family focused therapy for high risk youth, but not in the education control youth, suggesting network adaptions that may be related to improved self awareness and emotion regulation learned during family focused therapy for high risk youth. Um, so, do uh, um, I'm not going to ask if any of you know what family focused therapy is, I'm just going to explain briefly what family focused therapy is. Um, family focused therapy, the theme of family focused therapy is um, psychoeducation. Um, communication building skills and um, and problem solving skills within the family um, among adolescents. Um, and that is what um, changes the connectivity in those parts of the brain. Um, it is absolutely amazing. If any of you are interested, Dr. Manpreet um, K. Singh did a, a talk for us, um, which is in the uh, in the guide section. Um, it, that briefly mentions this, but I have a bunch of articles that I can share with you um, because it is very, very, very interesting. Not many um, treatment modalities can do can can affect the brain like um, like this can. Anyways, social factors leading to bipolar disorder and um, borderline personality disorder. Miss Kate. So because I'm the sociologist in the group, I'm going to be talking about social factors, and then we're going to go back to Catherine to talk about biological factors, because that's her expertise. Um, so with borderline personality disorder, the big thing that you see is childhood emotional invalidation. People with BPD often feel as though their caregivers fail to respond or confirm the child's emotional experiences by dismissing, trivializing, or punishing the child's emotional displays. This kind of failure leads to poor emotional regulation abilities, which leads to things like what I talked about before, difficulty understanding, labeling and trolling, controlling their own emotions. It also impedes healthy identity development, which is the inability to integrate emotions into a coherent self-image. Um, another thing you see with people who develop BPD is caregiver skepticism or hostility around a child's perceptions. And it makes a child doubt their own memory and reality. So it's almost like gaslighting for a child. It's horrible. Um, there are links found between invalidating childhoods and BPD behaviors, such as there's thought that self-injury and suicidal gestures, um, one of their purposes in people with BPD is to validate pain because they weren't, their pain was not validated by their parents when they were growing up or destructive actions to prompt caregiver response. I remember earlier I mentioned that some of the, um, 
some of the results of self-harm behavior in people with BPD is to get response from therapists. And so people with BPD often use their therapist as a substitute parent because they didn't get that kind of validation and support from their parent when they were growing up. So people with BPD often have unstable and neglectful households when they're growing up. They deal with parental loss, illness, substance abuse, uh, disorganized or unpredictable parenting. They have impaired caregiver attachments where their caregiver refuses or is unable to provide comfort and nurturing. People with BPD often experience childhood trauma such as physical, emotional, and sexual abuse or physical or emotional neglect. These kinds of instability in neglectful households lead to the inability to regulate emotions and lead to problems with identity and relationships. So people with BPD, they think that one reason that they use self-harming behaviors is in order to feel in control. So if you think about the fact that when they were growing up, people with BPD, when they were growing up, frequently feel as though they're out of control of their lives, out of control of their household, um, using self-harm is a way to feel in control of their lives again. And also self-harm is a way to um, uh, events dissociation from their painful childhood memories. So I've talked about the fact that people with BPD have difficulties with social interaction. And this comes from a de problems developing stable relationships. So I talked about the fact that they have intense fear of abandonment. And this leads to difficulty in trusting others and frequent arguments or breakups. They have difficulty regulating their emotions and they express their emotions intensely. And because they express their emotions in so intensely, often this leads to people who are around people with those with BPD distancing themselves from them because um, the experience of someone with BPD expressing their emotion can be so intense for someone who doesn't have BPD. People with BPD often overreact to minor issues they have a highly shifting self-image and a chameleon-like personality. So that's what I was talking about earlier, about, you know, now I'm this, now I'm this, now I'm this. Um, they're always trying on new personalities because they have a really unstable self, a sense of self. Um, these kinds of social interaction and self image difficulties can lead to social isolation, which leads to the loss of relationships, the avoidance of social events, and can cause problems functioning in school, work, and financial and housing instability. Now, moving on to social causes of bipolar disorder, Catherine's gonna talk more about the um, biological causes of bipolar disorder, but you'll see there's a lot of similarities here between the social causes of bipolar and the social causes of BPD. So you see here that we have the um, levels of criticism and hostility and negativity, lack of warmth of affection, these kinds of emotional affects within the household, within the child's household, can lead to bipolar disorder or can be one of the things that leads to bipolar disorder. Um, higher expressed emotion associated with more mood episodes and poor medication adherence. Um, with bipolar disorder, we looked at overprotecting and controlling parenting or chaotic and inconsistent parenting. And that's very similar to BPD, where you see how the inconsistent parenting leading to um, BPD. Um, there is a 2 to 4% higher rate of bipolar disorder when the first degree relative has the illness. And um, also what you see with bipolar disorder is that children model the negative communication styles of their parents. So if their parent or first degree relative has the illness or has some other mental illness, the child is going to mirror that or model it, which then can lead to bipolar disorder um, symptoms later in life. So just like with BPD, people with bipolar disorder often experience childhood trauma and loss. So again, you see sexual, physical, and violent, emotional abuse or witnessing domestic violence, uh, the death of a close family or friends, parental abandonment. All of those things can lead to borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder. 
Um, there's some theories about why trauma causes bipolar disorder and borderline. And some of the explanations include that trauma actually causes biological changes in the brain. So Catherine was just talking about the, 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 the ventricle, whatever, the... <laughs> The part of the lateral the, prefrontal cortex. Thank you. <laughs> that the trauma can actually change the way that our brains are developing in childhood. Um, trauma can also have a negative impact on childhood development, and also coping with grief and stress. If you have maladaptive maladaptive grief and stress coping mechanisms, that can lead to bipolar disorder or BPD. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about, this is my favorite slide of this whole presentation because I get to say zeitgebers, uh, bipolar disorder disruption of social zeitgebers. So social zeitgebers basically means your social rhythms. So we hear a lot about biorhythms and uh, your sleep wake, your sleep wake cycle. That's what a social zeitgeber is. I don't know why we don't just call it social biorhythms, <laughs> um, but zeitgebers are the external cues that set your biorhythm. So it's your sleep-wake cycle, your meal time, your light exposure. So your social zeitgebers organize our schedule. So work, school, social gathering times, interpersonal context. We know that we wake up at 6 a.m. and at 7.30 we start work and at noon we have lunch. And then at one, we go for a walk. And at six, we have dinner with our family. All of these social zeitgebers tell us how to react at a certain time. And with bipolar disorder, this kind of disruption in your social zeitgebers, like, for example, I woke up at four o'clock this morning and I've been working since four. So that's a disruption in my zeitgeber. And that kind of disruption can trigger bipolar episodes. Um, the social zeitgeber disruption is explained by rhyological factors. So it's a dysfunction in your circadian rhythm. And this kind of stress to your circadian rhythm can actually cause or trigger a bipolar episode, which is why our doctors are always so strong about saying you got to keep a schedule. Wake up at the same time, go to bed at the same time, eat at the same time. All of these social zeitgebers are important for preventing episodes. Now, there's also a cognitive link to our social zeitgebers, which is that uh, there's a belief that our mood is dependent on schedules, and there's a sense of instability when we lose our routine. So if we're used to waking up at six every morning and we sleep until noon, that makes us feel unstable. Like, oh, what am I supposed to do now? It's 1.30 and I haven't had breakfast yet. And so all of that disruption to our biorhythms and all that disruption to our social zeitgebers can cause a bipolar episode. Is bipolar disorder genetic? So the genetics of bipolar dis uh, of borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. All right, epigenetics and borderline personality disorder. So you're probably asking, what is epigenetics? Um, let's start with genetics first. Genetics is a study of heritable changes in gene activity or function due to the direct alteration of the DNA sequence. Such alterations include point mutations, deletions, insertions, and translocation. In contrast, epigenetics is a study of heritable changes in gene activity or function that is not associated with any of the change of the DNA sequence itself. Epigenetics means above genetics. Genes are not set in stone. The environment is what triggers turning on or off genes. It activates the genes to turn on, to turn into certain proteins and do a certain function. If something is not turned on, it's silenced. If it's turned on, it's expressed. DNA methylation is a direct chemical modification to the DNA. It is now well recognized that DNA methylation in, conser in, con in concert with other regulations is a major epigenetic factor influencing gene activities. Methyl, uh, methylated CPG sites were observed, and, and this is going to be a little bit above my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> methylated CPG sites were observed in several genes and inter, um, intergenic regions in the X chromosome um, and in chromosome 6. 
BPD patients shared significantly no lower methylation levels in the CPG sites than healthy controls. These differences seem to be increased by the existence of childhood trauma. Um, comparisons between BPD patients with childhood trauma and patients and controls without revealed significant differences in four genes, these four genes, none of them in the X chromosome. Gene set enrichment analysis revealed that epigenetic alterations were more frequently found in genes con um, controlling ost um, ostrogen. Estrogen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Estrogen regulation, neuro, uh, neurogenesis, and cell differenti uh, differentiation. I really need my glasses. These results um, suggest that epigenetic alterations in the X chromosome and estrogen regulation genes may contribute to the development of BPD and explain the differences in presentation between genders. Um, furthermore, childhood trauma events may modulate the, the magnitude of the epigenetic alterations contributing to BPD. So um, basically what it's saying is um, it's more often found in females um, and trauma can um, um, can change the the way the genes are um, what's um, I'm sorry what's what's it called um, altered um, so that um, so that it, it, uh, it the genes may be perfectly um, normal but epigenetics, is um, the the way um, the genes are expressed or silenced. <laughs> All right, genetics and bipolar disorder. A genetic study involving thousands of people with bipolar disorder has revealed new insight into the molecular underpinnings of the disorder. Researchers have put, pinpointed a gene called the ACAP2 as a strong risk factor for both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. The findings provide clues to how lithium works, as the ACAP2 protein is known to interact with the molecular pathway modified by this drug. While many common genetic variants of a small effect have been discovered, ACAP2 is the first gene found to have a large effect on bipolar disorder risk. To explore the molecular and behavioral effects of the ACAP2 gene variants uncovered in the study, um, researchers are now creating cellular and animal models carrying an alternative form of the gene. The altered form of the gene um, effectively disable one copy of the gene in the genome, potentially cutting the abundance of the ACAP2 protein in half. Models carrying genetic variants like these uh, um, and the protein alterations they produce are easier to create in the lab than those with more common disease related variants that occur in non-coding parts of the genome and that have unclear effects on protein function. Researchers will now be able to employ models harboring the same variants found to, clear, to clearly increase risk in humans. So bipolar disorder and comorbid borderline personality disorder. Um, so one thing that you need to know about um, this is it is essential to treat both disorders equally and not as though they are one single disorder. And what I mean by that is if you have bipolar disorder and you have borderline personality disorder and you're trying to treat, um, say, manic symptoms that are causing um, you to um, have risky behaviors and... Um, I, Basically, any 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 um any uh overlapping symptoms between the two, um, it is not it it is not good to treat them as if they were the same disorder. You want to treat them differently. The same with um disorders like um like pediatric bipolar disorder and ADHD, which a lot of psychiatrists make mistakes with. Um, this is a this is a mistake that a lot of mis, um, psychiatrists make. All right, so BPD is a common personality disorder that co-occurs with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder and BPD share many common characteristics, and the most crucial overlapping feature is mood instability. B 
BPD is common in bipolar disorder, especially in bipolar two disorder, um, more so in bipolar two disorder. Overall, up to 21.6% of bipolar disorder patients have comorbid BPD. Also, BPD comorbidity rates were highest among bipolar two participants, 37.7% recruited in North American studies, 26.2%. Males have a lower prevalence of comorbid BPD in bipolar disorder. Um, in, in, um, comorbid BPD in bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder and BPD comorbidity is common with approximately one in five people experiencing a comorbid diagnosis. That is a lot. Discriminating between BPD and bipolar disorder is difficult, as well as crucial in the clinical and critical evaluation of the comorbidity rates between the two. The odds of confusing BPD with bipolar disorder are, are particularly high for severe um, borderline personality disorder cases, essentially due to um, differential emphasis placed on um, similarities rather than differences between the two. Moreover, BPD and bipolar disorder share substantial overlap in mood lability. The symptom of impulsivity is closely allied to mood lability and is often seen as manifesting as sexual impulsivity in both BPD and bipolar disorder, although it can also be physical, aggressive, financial, or binge eating related. Um, so this is the this is overlapping features and then features that are um, that are common to one disorder and not the other. So with borderline personality disorder, we've already kind of talked about this. Um, we've got fear of abandonment, unstable self-image, unstable relationships, feeling of emptiness, mood often shaped by interpersonal conflicts, sudden and short-lived mood shifts. For bipolar disorders, um, their common um, features are uh, or symptoms are sleep disturbance, distinct euphoric and depressive states, mood often stable between episodes, sustained mood shifts lasting days or weeks. Now, overlapping features um, between the two. Affective lability, disproportionate anger, suicidality, risky behaviors, impulsivity, and delusions. So this is something that um, psychiatrists have to pay attention to when they're treating um, when they're treating their patients because um, with borderline personality disorder, your mood can shift like that. With bipolar disorder, unless you are experiencing ultradian rapid cycling, which is very, very rare and only really happens in children. Um, it takes weeks, which is also rare, um, but months. And if you have more than one episode in a year, that's rapid cycling. So um, moods often take a while to, uh, to change. All right, so um, this is, what is this? What did I do? One second. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Treatment for BPD. All right, so medication. Medication may be included, but it is not necessary. It includes mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, um, which is not common, antidepressants, and anti-anxiety medications. Um, now, we have to be aware that people with BPD um, can take antidepressants. Um, they will not experience mania unless they are also bipolar. Um, so psychotherapy, which is the most important thing for BPD. Um, this includes talk, family, or group therapy. Um, some forms of therapy that are helpful are trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, I'm sure you all have heard of that, schema-focused therapy, which focuses on identifying and changing specific unhealthy ways of thinking. The theory underlining this treatment modality presumes that when our basic needs, such as safety, acceptance, and love, are not adequately, are, are not adequately, um, 
treated. We develop unhealthy ways of interpreting and interacting with the world um, called maladaptive early schemas. This type of therapy identifies the patient's relative schemas and links these schemas to past events and current symptoms. Um, another, another treatment modality is systems training for emotional predictability and problem solving steps. Um, this treatment modality teaches people how to identify and challenge automatic ways of interpreting events in their lives called schemas. Some of the skills that are taught in steps include self-care skills, such as sleep, ex exercise, balanced eat eating, as well as problem solving, communication, and relationship skills. Um, now, good luck finding a therapist that practices those forms of therapy. That, that is hard. Um, but there are therapists who do. All right, so more. Um, treatment for bipolar disorder. Um, medications are usually necessary. I'm going to say that in my um, studies of bipolar disorder, the only form of bipolar disorder that um, that has been known to be not okay without medication, but people can live without medication and can handle episodes is bipolar 2 disorder. They will still experience episodes, um, but if they live a um, like a very, very uh, uh, what's it called um if they have their their life like completely planned out not their life but every day if their social zeitgers are totally in line <laughs> yes yes exactly thank you um and then yes they can they can live for a while without having an episode but episodes do pop up and we can't um we can't stop that um so anyways medications are usually necessary they include mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, antidepressants, not SSRIs, and anti-anxiety medications. Um, and I say not SSRIs because for those of you who don't know, SSRIs cause mania in people with bipolar disorder, especially bipolar 1 disorder. Um, psychotherapy, family-focused therapy, um, very hard to find in the United States. Um, but it is what I was talking about earlier. It is a very, very amazing therapy. Um, interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, also a very cool therapy. That's the type of ther therapy I practice and it's really helpful for my clients. Um, and it's basically um, teaching, teaching clients how to those social zeit zeitgeists. Is that what you what Yeah, yeah. Um, how how to live their life um so that chaos does not come out of nowhere and consume them um dbt um acceptance and commitment therapy one of my favorites cognitive behavioral therapy i um and group therapy for bipolar disorder if you ever get the chance to do group therapy i would do it it's pretty cool, you know, being around other people who have bipolar disorder and learning from them how they live and learning how not to live. Um, it's pretty cool. So. Uh, I think that's it. Did you guys have any questions for us? Thank you guys so much. I learned so much. Really? Oh, good. I did have a question. Um, I am currently seeing a therapist who um is like two years older than me. <laughs> so she's still learning as well. She's a student, she's a student. Um, and then she wanted to do family focused therapy with me, but then I was wondering if it'd be better to see someone who's older who does like regular family therapy or just do family do it with her. She's doing family focused therapy? Mm -hmm. Um, with your family? Yeah. Um, no. And I say this because I, I'm 34 years old and some of my clients are older than me and mm -hmm. I do therapy with them and, um, and I, I, they love me. At least they say they love me. Um, it doesn't matter how old they are. 
it 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 matters how how much effort they put into it and how much knowledge they have of it um okay so um family focused therapy it it's not it's not a hard therapy to do I, i'm i'm going to say that um it is literally psychoeducation communication um building skills and problem solving skills within the family um i do it um uh, I will do family focused therapy. I will also do the uh, the themes of family focused therapy with my clients. Um, and it is very, very helpful. It doesn't matter how old your therapist is, unless they're an intern. Um, you know, interns, you got it. Uh, I think she is an intern. <laughs> but she's she's really smart and she um is culturally appropriate for me um and go so, for it never yeah. never never pass up an opportunity to to do something now if she if if she's not um if if it feels like it's not working or if if it feels like something's wrong then you're welcome to say stop i i, I this is not working for me um but just because of her age or or because of um um her uh what's it called um background does not mean that she can't do it like um i had a very very strong background in family focused therapy before i became a therapist um it it's just um and a lot of therapists we have that problem we're we're young we get to be we are some of us are younger than our clients or um and our clients don't take us seriously for that reason um but it 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 is uh the only problem with interns is that they leave yeah yeah so yeah, I'll, I'll i'll <sighs> I'll I'll talk about it. I I had one session with my mom that went well, so I'll talk to everyone about it and we'll see. Thank have you so much. Have you um read uh the bipolar disorder survival guide? What? Have you read the bipolar disorder survival guide by um, David Mikowitz? Uh, no. David Mikowitz did a talk for us on his book. Um, it's in the guide section. Um, what what's your name? Sally or uh Yu Yang or Sally Jiang last name J I A N G. J I A N G. Okay, I'm going to post it um in the group for you, um mm -hmm. so you can check it out. Um, it is it, he is oh my god he's amazing and that book is wonderful. Um, it's a very easy read. He's a very very good writer and it's just it just talks about family focused therapy and the basics of it. I'm also going to post the article on um on uh how family focused therapy improves connectivity in the brain. Um, in the ventral lateral prefrontal vortex. Okay. So I will post that. And do you mind if I tag you in it? No, I don't mind. Okay. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I see. Crap, I'm, bi I'm diagnosed bipolar 2, and I'm clearly seeing bipolar disorder. Oh, BPD2 signs, which seem to have appeared in the last month. Super discouraging. I've never really looked or researched BPD. Um. How do you pronounce your name, Veronique? You could just say V. That's the name I use in English. <laughs> v. Okay. Um, so, um, BPD, it's, it's not fun, but therapy does really help for it. And if you're noticing signs, I I would uh I would bring it up with a therapist. Um and um there are a lot of support groups on um on Facebook for borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. So um you can check those out. Um and I always say join a join a a group um therapy. Uh, session because you can learn a lot from other people you can learn a lot um things to try and things not to try um so um and also never diagnose yourself have someone diagnose for you um 
and um yeah any other questions and I just want to say, B, it's nice to meet you. I have um, provided so much research for you over the last several months, and I love your questions, and it's nice to finally meet you. So, any other questions? Yeah, Kat? I know yeah. you talk you talk a lot about childhood early onset of bipolar. Is there any information out there? Or have you heard anything about early onset of borderline? Oh, that, um, early onset of borderline. Yeah, is there anything on that? It, it's like, my what? understanding is that borderline doesn't really start until adolescence because it's usually caused from childhood trauma. Okay. Um, and so if you're seeing symptoms of early onset stuff in childhood, it may be more likely bipolar than borderline. Is that your understanding, Kat? Yeah, because if you're seeing if you're seeing symptoms of um, of like mood instability um, in childhood um, and it's up and down, up and down, up and down, like what I said earlier, only children really experience ultradian rapid cycling. There is rapid cycling and that's having more than one episode a year. There's ultra rapid cycling and that's months and weeks. And then there's ultradian rapid cycling and that is days and hours. And that is rare. And that happens with children. And that is why children get, um, um, that's why we have a hard time diagnosing children because the DSM, we follow the DSM as to how to diagnose children, and it doesn't um it, it doesn't show ultradian rapid cycling. Um, but yes, ultradian mm -hmm. rapid cycling is um is more likely if it's in a child. Um but there are other things um that you that you'd want to watch out for. How how early is early onset? Bipolar, bipolar disorder yeah i have seen children in our office as young as three wow. okay i've got a six-year-old granddaughter and she's she i noticed self-harming behavior from her lately so i had to sit down and talk to her i um, was six when i went when i had my onset yeah and she her mom is bipolar and of course i am too so she's got really good genes yeah, it's about 15 to 30 percent. I might be wrong. 15 to 30 percent if you have one parent that's bipolar. So, yeah. So Self-injury, Shannon, also occurs within bipolar disorder. But yeah. it also, one of the interesting things about the DSM is that right now, self-harm or self-injury only occurs diagnostically within borderline personality disorder. But self-harm as a symptom occurs in lots of different disorders. And there's a lot of debate right now in the psychiatric community about whether to make self-harm its own diagnosis, just like cannabis use disorder or alcoholism or whatever. Yeah. They, that's its own disorder. And so there's a lot of people that are pushing to make self-harm its own disorder and disassociate it from borderline because a lot of people who don't have borderline personality disorder do self-harm. So just because she's self-harming at such a young age doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that she has borderline. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I was thinking more of the bipolar because she's got the great genes for it. But, yeah. Um, the um, self-harm part of it reminded me of borderline. Yeah, border self-harm can occur in any kind of disorder. Um, I just put, I think that's the website. Um, I, I always get it wrong. Um, has she been um, seeing a psychiatrist yet? No, this is, I just noticed it within the last, I would say like three weeks and okay. she's down in, she's down in Kansas city and up in Wisconsin. So, it's and her mother, her mother does, if I say anything to her mother, her mother will say that, yeah, I'm just trying to make her sick. Okay. Well, if you ever do want to get a consult from a, a, a neuropsychopharmacologist, my boss, um, I always convince him to do free consults for children. Okay. So I will definitely let you know. Let let me know. That's his website, and um, and he that's the one thing he does is free consults for children. Yay! Um, so and DB, I'm in DBT, and that works a lot. If just anybody wants to know, I do DBT every Monday, and that is really good for emotion re regulation. Yeah, DBT is a, a very good uh, 
treatment modality. A lot of people hate it. <laughs> yeah, it's just that you love it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. But thank you, guys. Thank you, Shannon. Any other questions? And don't oh. be afraid that that you have BPD. Um, just you know, just because, just because it it's so common with bipolar disorder. It 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 these these diagnoses are so hard to tell apart. You really need help from a psychiatrist and a good psychiatrist. I have one last question. Um, I don't know if you guys this kind of like not on topic because it's about ADHD as well. Yeah. But like com com comorbid comorbidity. Um like I tend to notice that when I get manic, I um have like more ADHD symptoms. So I don't know like what to do about that. Like talk should I just talk to my therapist about that and see what they think? Uh, I would talk to your psychiatrist about it. Psychiatrist, mm -hmm. but um are you diagnosed bipolar one or bipolar two? Or one. Okay, and how's how um if you don't mind me asking, if you don't um how is how are your medications um doing for your episode? They're doing really well right now. I'm I, I have to be really regimented and take them out at very specific times. Um but they're actually doing pretty well. Um uh, I'm on some 50 milligrams of Depico and 80 milligrams of Judon and I take that with breakfast and dinner. Okay. Um do you, does your psychiatrist feel like they can treat you for ADHD? Um, I can ask them. I haven't talked to them about that. Because it sometimes it takes a couple of years before your psychi of of stability before your psychiatrist is and it, and some psychiatrists won't. But um, before your psychiatrist will be like, okay, I think your medications will handle the ADHD medications because I'm bipolar one. It took, um. It took from 2000, from 19 to 25 before I was able to get onto um, ADHD medications. Um, but um, it's- like hydroxyzine? What? Hydroxyzine? What? Like a hydroxyzine is one of them? That's okay. No, with hydroxyzine is uh, an antihistamine. It's oh, okay. A, it's, a, it's for, um, it's used for anxiety. Mm -hmm. Some oh. doctors will prescribe it for ADHD before they give you stimulants. When, oh, okay. when my doctor was first ramping me up on ADHD medications, they first prescribed hydroxyzine and then they prescribed something else and then they finally prescribed stimulants. Um, before you even go on stimulants, ask about modafinil. Yeah, that's what I take for my ADHD is modafinil, and I love I, it. I wish I was on modafinil right now. It is not a stimulant. It's supposed to make you think clearer than than uh, it's for narc in a uh, narcolepsy. It's right? for narcolepsy. Yeah, yeah, it's for narcolepsy. It, it is a very it's used off label for ADHD, and it's I have heard only good things about it. I love it. I love it. It's, and you spell into the M O D A F. I N I L modafinil. I, I put it in the chat, but um, yeah, that um, and I'll I'll put up a let me put up I'll, I'll write this down. I'll put up a um, an article on modafinil for you. Okay. You just put up an article about modafinil, didn't you? No, I just saw one. Maybe a while ago. Maybe a while ago, yeah, yeah. So like, I take modafinil for my, and I have schizoaffective disorder, and I take uh, modafinil for ADHD, and it works wonders for me, way better than um, I used to take uh, Ritalin, way better than Ritalin ever did. Thank yeah. you. See, I'm on. I was on Focalin, and the stimulant shortage has put me on um, Ritalin. And now the the stimulant shortage has me on Ritalin, Ritalin I, IL or whatever the long long lasting one, and it just doesn't work for me. And even so, Ritalin doesn't work for me um, very much. But because of the shortage, I can't get my regular medication. So I am trying to switch to modafinil, but I've been on it for seven years, I think. So that that switch that uh um getting off of the stimulant is really hard especially when i'm building up a caseload at my job oh 
So uh, I'm waiting to do it. But modafinil, I'm trying, I'm going for modafinil. I would too. Kate is right. Mm -hmm. Do you take uh? Do you guys take it, or would you recommend it for as needed, or should I talk to my doctor? No, so definitely you talk to your doctor about it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. I like your plant. Ah, oh, <laughs> thank you. It's, it's an orchid. Oh, cool. I'm an orchid grower. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I killed all my orchids. Now I'm on to elephant ears. <laughs> <laughs> Check this one out. It's gonna. It's going to bloom pretty soon. Oh, look, it's got all of these beautiful, beautiful buds on it. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't show and tell. <laughs> all right. Anyone else have any questions? Well, I will post, Sally, I will post a couple things for you. What did I say I was going to post for you? Bipolar survival guide. Um, yeah. I can message you so you know what my name is. Oh, yeah, that would help. My name's pretty easy. It's, no one has it. <laughs> Katrin or Katrine? Katrin. Katrin, okay. Um, yeah, and um, and when Dr. Um, Miklowitz did the talk for us, he is such a sweetheart. So, um, and he is very easygoing, laid back, and he he talks in layman's terms, and it's just he's just a one wonderful human being. I get to meet Didn't him. Did he do the first talk for us? Not Wasn't the first, the first not speaker? the post did the first talk. The first post was the first speaker. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I heard of the book, but I didn't, I haven't seen it or I haven't read any of it. So, can I get a guide to for bipolar two? That would be a good guide for you. Um, it's, it's a good, uh, guide for anyone who has bipolar disorder or family members. The bipolar disorder survival guide by Dr. David J. Nicklowitz. Um, and I'm going to be posting it in the group. I'll tag you in it too, uh, LaTanya. Um, and me as well. And Thank you as well? Well. Yes. Um, any other articles you guys want, want, um, want to, uh, Oh, did I mention, I'm sorry, my brain is like scatterbrained right now. Did I mention that we, we have a, a guest speaker? Yes, you did. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I'm scatterbrained. Hey, can you tell me a little bit about that? I missed a little bit of the talk earlier. Oh, okay. So um, we have Dr. Mary um, L. Phillips um, out of uh, University of Pittsburgh or something. I can't remember. Um, she won the Colvin Prize for um, Advancements in Mood Disorder Research. Um, she uh, she wrote a paper and she does research on um, on uh, finding biomarkers for bipolar disorder to diagnose it easier. Um, so she's going to be talking about that um, in her talk. It is on, on a Thursday at one o'clock. So I know a lot of people aren't going to be able to make it, but it will be recorded, um, as always. And it will be put in the guide section. Um, Julie fast, take charge of bipolar disorder. Oh, we all know what I think it's Julie fast. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Uh, yeah, I think I'll I'll look into the uh, event. I think it's posted. I I noticed it, but I just didn't know anything about it. Yeah, um, there's her there's a her prize. Uh, w the video she she made for winning um that prize is in there, um, uh, in the featured section, um, and it has her whole bio. Um, thank you. So your boyfriend is bipolar too and has other mental health issues too. He is a veteran. I want him to do the biomarkers thing, but he deals with the VA mostly treatment for alcohol abuse. Um, have you have you ever looked into EMDR? 
Um, no, he uh, he is not uh, so open to treatment for bipolar. He's really in denial about it. He does take medication, though. Okay. Um, what other mental health issues, if you don't mind me asking? Um, suicidal ideology, PTSD. That's why I mentioned the EMDR. The EMDR would help with the PTSD and the alcohol abuse. Um, okay. It is it um, EMDR. Mm -hmm. And I can put an article in there, too, about EMDR for you. Um, your apartment. <laughs> it is... It is a really, it is a really hard uh, um, mm -hmm. treatment mm -hmm. modality. Mm -hmm. It is one of those treatment modalities that it takes a lot out of you, but a 80% success rate for PTSD. Mm -hmm. So it is amazing. Um, okay. There, the, the, but you have to be pretty committed to do it. I mean, and if your boyfriend is not, really committed to treatment emdr take like kedrin said takes a lot out of you i mean you have yeah. to be really committed yeah he um only just goes to the va and he's okay. only been treated for like uh alcohol abuse there uh oh yeah also he has a tbi too he has had several of those so he is not getting very much mental health treatment from them since he's been involved with them huh so i've been trying to uh get him to uh get more help from uh other clinics here but since he does not have insurance he doesn't want to pay out of his pocket um. so uh, he has like a a mad doctor there that uh, talks to him maybe once every three months, uh, you know, to see how the medication is doing. But, you know, you can't take that medication when you're drinking. So he will drink for at least uh, three months straight. Uh, getting him to go to the VA has been a challenge as well. Now, at first it wasn't so much of a problem, but now since he's had that TBI, it's a little bit more difficult to get him to go there to be treated. Um, I, yeah, the VA, I, I, when it comes to bipolar disorder is awful. Um, yeah. I, have you, I will, I will put down and I will tag you in it. The bipolar disorder survival, survival guide. It is a good book to have. Kate, that's something that I, I'm going to bring up to you. That's an idea that I just came up with mm -hmm. um, to collect, to buy a bulk stock of, of those books and yeah. and send them to people who need them in the organization. That would be a great idea. I would bring that up with Susanna. Yeah. Well, in our next um, meeting. Who so. is that book by? Uh, Dr. David J. J. Miklowitz. Um, I put it up here, but I, I put it in the chat. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tag you in it. Um, on on the in the group, so you see okay. it. Um, he also did a talk for us. Um, and on his book, so I'm gonna be posting that again too, and I'll tag you in that too. Um, and that is, it is so helpful to become self aware. Um, it is so helpful to learn co um, communication skills, to talk about how you're feeling, what's going on right now, um, and then um, problem solving skills. Okay, I'm. this is what's going on. How are we going to deal with this as a family? Yeah, our communication right now sucks. Uh, I set boundaries for myself. When he drinks, I don't go nowhere near him. And uh, one thing I have done that he hates is I take his wallet and his keys to his vehicle because he will drive like that. But the VA, what they've told me is to make sure the alcohol leaves. So the only way I know how to make the alcohol leave is to take his wallet because he doesn't have access to money 
you know, so that may not be a, a great tool, but that's what I've learned from the VA. And I'm in there like a caregiving program with them, uh, you know, to try to help him. But uh, right now we're not communicating so well because I've taken his keys and taken them all apart to give to different people in his family. So he's not too happy about that. And the yeah. fact that uh, when he is in the bipolar realm, as I call it, he takes out everything in his room and it's like a tornado hit it. So, uh, and that makes me really upset that he does that. Like uh, a few weeks ago, he was looking for his truck key. Where was it at? In his jacket pocket that he had on. So I got so mad at him, I took it, took his wallet and told him to get out the room and don't come back in there. And, you know, I don't want to treat him like he's a two-year-old because he's not. But he says he's tired of everybody treating him like a two-year-old. So what I do, well, what I have been doing is uh, like he's when he tells me he has energy or he's energized to me that means you got a lot of energy and you need to do something to get rid of it but in his realm that's not what that meant so you know I suggested that he write down his symptoms and he tells me the meaning of it to him so I could understand him a lot better yeah so um with uh it it's rough it's rough on the opposite end and it's rough on your end oh, let me just say this i want to thank you for going through this for for supporting him because it is not easy it is so difficult with someone who is bipolar and you are supporting him and you are taking care of him and i have to thank you because you know, without my parents, I don't know where I would be without their support. And I, he he has you, and that's wonderful. So you know, you should be you should be look at yourself and and, and realize you are doing a lot for him. Um, now it is hard for our, um for people with bipolar disorder to have things like taken away from them, um, because yeah. it's like I'm not a child. Um, just because I have a disorder doesn't mean I'm a child. Um, the VA sucks for a bipolar disorder. I know this for a fact because my I have a couple friends who are bipolar who um who are in the army, and it it just uh, they they didn't treat him the way they should have. Um, they they I ended up having to get them to go see my boss um to get them on the right medications, but that's okay. a different story. Um. Now, um, the Bipolar Disorder Survival Guide, um, that's a good book to read um, if, if you um, have the chance to get that. Um, I will send you a link to it where it's only like five, six dollars. Um, okay, because I do got like about five or six books about uh, bipolar for different things. Uh, a few of them to help him. And then the rest of them are to help me because I've been with him for seven years. And basically this last month, our relationship has not been good for the last two to three years, but I know he needs help and I do love him and care about him. And, you know, I feel just because you're bipolar or whatever issue you may have, you still uh you know deserve good things you know people that are going to be in your life and going to be true to you so i would not uh dump him for that reason but really right now the way things are going i really want to dump him because uh a lot of things that i think that could be prevented like his medication management if he's drinking he can't take his medication so I think uh, his bipolar and this alcoholism have been, you know, they feed off of each other. So I think the more better he manages his medication, and I believe me, I help him with that. You know, I make sure he takes it and how he's supposed to take it. 
when I'm there with him. But uh, a lot of times, you know, I'm like, hey, I got my own stuff to take and I need to take care of myself. So I feel some of that is his responsibility. So our relationship has been terrible for the last probably couple of months, like really bad. Like I am basically hanging on a threaded piece of thread and I'm like, look, you need to take responsibility. You need accountability. And if you do not do this stuff, I am going to like, you're going to be single. And so, you know, you do like that's That's also what I tell people. You know, like, um, you know, so having a support system is amazing, but you have to treat your support system with respect and you have to do your part. You have to do your part and not have them do everything for you. If you are, if you are not, um, if you are not, uh, working towards getting better and you're just letting yeah. someone else take care of you, that's not fair. And what kind right. of life are you living? You know, like when he would tear his room up, uh, you know, I am, I don't like, well, I live in a tiny apartment, so I got a lot of books and art stuff, but his was just like everything everywhere. And I'm like, no, this is chaos. And he says, yes, I like chaos. I thrive off of chaos. So you know what? His side of the room is chaotic. My side is very structured and clean. So, you know, when he's in that chaos, I can't stay there because it just drives me crazy. So this last time it took me two hours to clean his room because I couldn't stay there. So this last time he did that, I'm like, you know what? I can't stay here. See you later. If you clean your room, I'll stay. But if you're not going to clean it, I'm not staying here. So I left for seven days. Wait one second, Kate. I will look up. I will go to bipolar disorders journal and look up to see the status of our paper. Good. Thank you. I'll do that after this. All right. Nice meeting you, Latanya and Sally. Bye, Bye Kate. I'll talk Bye. to you soon. See you later. So, um, if you want to continue this conversation sometime, um, I would be more than happy to. Not as a clinician, um, okay. as someone who's bipolar, um, who has this experience and who, um, who has put my parents through so much and who has realized like, I can't do that anymore. I have to do my part and I do do my part. Um, it's hard though, because PTSD is really hard. Yeah. yeah. I um, mean, I have PTSD too, and I take really good care of myself I have a therapist and I have a psychiatrist and I just started taking the antidepressant and at, at first I didn't want to be on any drugs for any of this stuff and I'm like you know Dude. what I think I really need that you know and uh, I'm waiting for it to make me happy and he keeps telling me it doesn't really work like that but you know taking it at night has helped me a lot better did he just get deployed like did he just come back no, so he has not even been in the military for six years, seven years. Well, let's see, wait a minute, maybe 10 years. Yeah. So, gonna, you know. I was going to ask, what book was the best one for you for supporting yourself, like, through the crisis, of, like, through someone else having bipolar? Um. Well, I think it's by Julie Fast, I think is her name. And And basically, you know, I had to learn all this stuff on my own. So I did a lot of reading of the Bipolar Hope magazine. It was really helpful to me and just educating myself on uh, different articles and really paying attention to him. I I told him, I said, you're like a serious uh, test. You know, I have to study you, watch you, uh, learn as I went along. And I did a lot of writing about his uh, stuff. I have a lot of documentation of his his life story, basically. You know, I would take pictures of him uh, doing falling, uh, sleeping, uh, burning food, trash in the refrigerator, you know, his behaviors. Basically, I have a lot of documentation on that. So that helped me 
to learn, okay, well, this month you'll have this behavior, the next month you may not have it, 